Okay. You got it? Yeah. I was about to say, we're waiting, honey. No. All right. Okay, let's get started. Um, so first off, my apologies. I, I, I went to upload the recording for lecture one, and I listened to it, and the audio was just horrible. I don't know what was up with my microphone. I've used that microphone before, but I haven't obviously used it you know, throughout the summer. And I went to listen to it. It was all garbled. You couldn't understand anything. And uh, I just decided I'm, I'm just going to scrap that. Um, so I'm trying a different uh, method. I'm using the, the university's Panopto software that they just started this semester. So I'm actually using the ambient mics in the room. And uh, I think there's actually a camera that's, that's shooting on me as well. That'll probably cause the YouTube upvotes to go down and whatnot. That's a joke. Not a very funny one. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so apologies for that. But we'll see how this goes. Um, I, again, I haven't uploaded any attendance dates and whatnot. We still have a couple students here and there that are adding and dropping throughout the week. So I'll upload that after Friday. Um, now, I am assigning homework 1.1 today. It's going to be due Friday. Uh, it's due Friday at 8 a.m. via Blackboard. The idea is that, like, when you come into class, the homework's already done so we can move on to the, uh, to the next topic. Um, this one is set up. Uh, a little differently than the ones that are going to be set up later in the semester. It's set up as an untimed quiz, so it's going to look like it's a test on Blackboard, even though it's not. Uh, you can open it, uh, check it out. You can save your results, come back later. You, I also set it up for unlimited submissions, so you can keep doing it over and over again, and it's going to grade based off of your highest grade. Um, the whole point of... Um, of uh, this was just is, is I really just want to get you into the groove of these uh, these daily homework assignments. I don't want this first homework assignment to be the source of a great deal of stress. Um, so yeah, so that'll open at 9 a.m. right after class, uh, and that'll be due Friday at, at 8 a.m. Now we're going to be using the class notebook today. Just make sure that you all can access that via Teams. If you go to the um, the Teams channel for the class, which I made a post on the Teams channel uh, last night. So I just want to make sure that y'all see that. I made a post where I basically was just welcoming everybody to class, and I was uh, letting everybody know about what happened with the recording for Lecture 1. But if you go to the Teams channel and you go to Class Notebook and you navigate um, to the folder in Content Library, you will see the calculations that we're going to be doing today. And again, what we're going to be doing today is very basic, um, but I just wanted to make sure that, that uh, everybody has access to that. Sound good? Okay. All right. So... What we're going to do today uh, is go through some very basic um, fundamentals. We're going to be doing a very brief review of physics, uh, or at least the physics concepts that are really necessary for this class, and then we're going to have a discussion on units and, and dimensional analysis. I will say that um, in terms of units, uh, I mean, we're, we are going to need to be doing uh, things in, in appropriate unit systems in this class, but I would argue that um, the actual manipulation and conversion of units is really not something that's very difficult in this course. Um, and, and I say that with the understanding that there are some courses later on where manipulation of units is actually a little bit trickier. So as an example, if you take Engineering 216 or maybe uh, the biomedical equivalent, BME 302, I think it is, uh, where you're um, doing stress analysis, the actual... Uh, uh, dealing of moments and stresses and deflections and actually all those unit conversions that go along with that. There's actually a, can be a little bit more involved with that than there is in here. Whereas in here, we're basically dealing strictly with forces and distances. So as long as everything's in a consistent unit, you can sort of, uh, um, I don't want to say ignore it, but you can sign a, kind of go past that and it's not too big of a deal. Okay, so let's review some physics. Um, I want to talk about Newton's laws. I want to talk about velocity, acceleration, and forces. Forces is really the star of the show uh, in this class. I want to talk about gravity, uh, and then we'll get into units uh, here in a bit. Okay, so let's talk about classical motion. So I know it's 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm already throwing out some calculus out of here. Like, you got to be kidding me. My coffee hasn't even uh, gotten in. But don't worry. I don't, I don't think this is too bad. Um, and I think if you have a basic understanding of some physics, this won't be uh, too difficult. Uh, but if not, uh, this is, for the most part, these next couple slides are really all you need to know. So whenever you um, start a course in undergraduate physics, really the first thing that you cover is classical motion, right? So you have some object moving, and we try and characterize that motion. So we can define that motion with some function, right? So we're in math land. So maybe we'll say that's some function x, and we'll say that x is as a function of time. So we'll, basically what x is defining is its position, 
right? So at time t equals zero, the object is here. And at time t equals one second, the object is here, right? So in one second, the object traveled from here to here, right? So that's, that's a, uh, the initial definition of motion is defining its position. So the first function would be defining its position as a function of time. So if at time t equals zero, the object is here, and at time t equals one, the object is here, then in that one second, the object moved from here to here. And so if we talk about this from an algebra perspective, if we divide the total distance traveled by the time it took to travel that distance, we have its velocity, okay? Now there is a difference between velocity and speed, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail, maybe in a little bit, um, but essentially for the purposes of what we're talking about now, we can say that that's the same thing. So velocity is basically how fast your position is changing. It is the rate of change of position, right? Now in calculus land, right, we can represent that with a derivative. We can say that if I have some function uh, x, which represents the position of some object, and I take the derivative of that function with respect to time, I now have a new function which represents the object's velocity. Make sense? Okay, so that, that's basically the definition of velocity. So the, the velocity is defined as the rate of change of position, right? Well, um, we have a further uh, concept in uh, classical motion, which is called acceleration. And that's what happens if you take the derivative of velocity. In other words, so velocity is how fast your position is changing. Acceleration is how fast your velocity is changing, okay? So those, so acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. So it's the derivative of velocity. Or if we extend that into position, it's the second derivative uh, uh, of position. Everybody so far so good on that concept? I think most of you have probably been exposed to that before, um, but if not, I think that's probably about as complicated as we're really gonna get. Now, one thing I do wanna note is that if you look at my uh, mathematical formulas right here, um, it looks like I don't know how to use Word or, or PowerPoint because some letters are bolded and some are not. Um, that's on purpose, okay? Um, this course um, has uh, uh, a particular mathematical object that we're going to be exploring throughout the entirety of the semester, and that is what's known as a vector, okay? Um, and without uh, getting too far into the weeds of things, a, a vector is a mathematical object that contains two quantities, a magnitude and a direction, okay? So when we're talking about position, velocity, acceleration, and whatnot, we represent those with vectors because not only do we want to know the magnitude, but we want to know the direction in which they're acting. A very simple example of this concept is the concept of gravity. Okay, so gravity, or the acceleration due to gravity, is a pretty uh, constant value, or at least we as engineers can accept that as a constant value here on, on, on planet Earth. And so... Uh, skipping ahead a little bit into the slides, I think you all probably know that the acceleration due to gravity is around 9.8 meters per second squared. Is that somewhat common? Okay. Well, gravity could be represented by a vector because not only does it have a magnitude, a magnitude of 9.8 meters per second squared, it has a direction because it acts down. Okay. So that is, um, th that's one of the nuances that we see here in this class. It's also the difference between velocity and speed. Velocity, uh, we, uh, we tend to characterize velocity as a vector because it has a magnitude and a direction. The car is traveling 50 miles per hour that way, right? So velocity, whereas its speed is just the magnitude of 50 miles per hour. And so whenever you see something uh, represented by a bold letter, either in your textbook or in the slides, that constitutes a vector quantity. So for example, time, is not represented with a, a bold letter because time is a scalar. Time doesn't, at least for our purposes, and I'm not getting into Stephen Hawking land or anything, time doesn't really have a direction, right? How long did it take? It took one hour. It didn't take one hour that way. It just took one hour. So time, we, that's the difference between a scalar and a vector. Does that make sense? Don't worry. We're going to formally define that stuff and get into that into much more details later. I just want you to understand the context now for, for what we're talking about. Okay, let's talk about Newton's three laws of motions. I, uh, I think that even if you don't have a, uh, a background in physics, you probably, or a course background in physics, I should say, you have probably at least heard of these laws of motion. 
Um, we are going to, um, in one way, shape, or form, utilize all these laws in this class. I mean, we're not going to be like writing equations for every one of them, but the principles of engineering statics are built uh, 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 based on these three laws. So the first law basically states that an object that is at rest or in motion will remain at rest or in motion until acted upon by an outside force. Okay, and so one of the, the analogies to that in statics is that the fundament, one of the fundamental equations of statics is that for a given system, the net sum of forces on that system is zero. I'll give you a real basic example. Here I am, I'm standing on this floor, so I have a certain weight and I'm pushing down on the floor system right now, right? So there is a vector associated with the force generated by Dr. Mike. I'm standing here generating a force acting down, but I'm not moving right now, right? I'm not falling through the floor because the floor is responding with a vector in the opposite direction, a reaction. We call that a reaction force. You can see what we're talking about. That sort of relates to, uh, to Newton's third law as well. So however much I weigh, the floor is responding with a vector in the opposite direction. So in this situation, we can consider that static because the net forces on that system that I just described is zero. That's important to engineers because if I'm the person designing the floor system or the beams or the columns in this building or, or what have you, I need to understand those reaction forces and those internal responses in order to appropriately design them. So you can kind of see the big picture again of why you're sitting here at 8 o'clock in the morning. Okay, so that's the first law. Second law is that the uh, an object's rate of change of momentum is directly proportional to the applied force. And this is most commonly expressed by the equation F equals MA, force equals mass times uh, acceleration. Now, um, uh, where this is going to become important in here is every now and then you're going to be given a problem where uh, I, uh, you are given an object's mass and not an object's weight, and you will need to convert that uh, utilizing the acceleration due to gravity. So the, what I would just say about this law is just whenever you get a mass in kilograms, always think oh, we need to convert that to forces, okay, because that's what we deal with in this class is we deal with forces and moments. And we'll talk about moments later. And finally, all forces between two objects uh, exist in equal magnitude in opposite direction. Again, relating to the uh, uh, discussion of reactions uh, that I discussed earlier. So far, so good? Okay. Now, um, another law which doesn't, uh, um, it's not, it's not, uh, uh, lumped into Newton's three laws of motion, but it is incredibly important uh, for basic uh, classical motion, and, and especially for what we're talking about here, is Newton's law of universal gravitation. So Newton's law of universal gravitation states that any two objects um, that uh, are just exist um, with mass, we'll call them mass big M and mass little m, uh, if they exist in the universe, these two objects, and they are separated by some distance r, that there is a gravitational force um, uh, of attraction between them. And you can compute that force pretty easily. The magnitude of that uh, uh, force, that attractive force between them, is computed by taking big M times little m, so that's the mass of object one and the mass of object two, okay? We divide that by r squared, r squared, whoop, R squared is the distance between the two objects, and then we multiply that by G, and G is the universal gravitational constant that exists everywhere uh, in the universe. And where now that's really high-level physics concepts. What we do here uh, in on planet Earth is we say, all right, uh, we won't we won't use that general law of universal gravitation. Like we won't use this very often. But what we can do is say, okay, we're on planet Earth, okay. So if we take big M as the mass of the Earth, and we take R as the radius of the Earth, and rearrange all of this, we can say that the force generated by some object, or in this case, the weight of an object, is the mass of that object times this, GM over R squared. GM over R squared is little g, 9.8 meters per second squared, is the acceleration due to gravity. So if you want to know where that value comes from, that um, uh, uh, 9.8 meters per second squared, it comes from this. It comes from the universal constant of the universe. It comes from the mass of the Earth, and it comes from the radius. It's one of those reasons why the acceleration due to gravity can change 
little bit here and there, depending upon whether or not you're in, say, Huntington, West Virginia, or you're in, you know, Denver or whatnot, because you're farther apart from the center of the earth and whatnot. Does that make sense? So, am I good so far? Okay. Now, um, so yeah, so um, to compute uh, the, ob the weight of an object, we do need to know the acceleration due to Earth's gravity. Um, again, dependent upon where you're at on the planet, that's going to change. But for the purposes of engineering computations, um, it's sufficiently accurate to use these quantities. So uh, I tend to use 9.81 meters per second squared uh, for SI units. And I tend to use 32.2 feet per second squared for USCS units. And I do want to say a little bit, I'm gonna, I don't want to get too much on my soapbox, but I do want to say a little bit about SI versus US units. Um, I am no uh, fool. I do certainly recognize that, that SI units make more sense from a computational perspective. They are a little bit easier to manipulate uh, and they, they do have a much more broad applicability. But as engineers, I don't think we can fully um, get away from US units. The way I uh, describe it is that until I can go to Home Depot and regularly find meter sticks more than I find yardsticks, um, we're using U.S. units as engineers. It's just no way of getting around it. Um, Home Depot stocks two by fours. That's in inches, right? So, so as engineers, we kind of need to be able to manipulate both unit systems. I have found that students that are comfortable in both unit systems just tend to be stronger in their engineering computations. So I'm going to expose you to both. Um, I don't think it's really going to be too much of a, a hurdle for what we do in this class, but we do kind of need to uh, deal with both. It's just sort of the way of the world. Yes, sir. And as an actual question, like as an, for an engineering professional, um, do you usually buy, if you, if you have to put in an order for like, huge amounts of like metal or something, do you usually buy in feet? I believe it's mostly feet. That's that's how the, that's how it works here in America. Is you're buying material based on uh, 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 unit cost per pound, unit cost per foot, you know, concrete unit cost per cubic yard. That's just how it is. I, mean. that, that's, I feel like that's also a good reason why technology is very important because sometimes you have things that require that. That <laughs> we're pretty much speaking the same language. I mean, pretty much speak the same language. Any other questions? It's good stuff, but please don't don't hesitate. Um, I want to make sure that you all are getting your money's worth and whatnot. All right, so far so good. Let's talk about these unit systems. Um, and by the way, just uh, just to reemphasize, these slides are available on Blackboard. So in fact, they're up now. Every uh, uh, slideshow between now and what we cover on exam one is currently available on Blackboard. So um, you can download those, print those off to your leisure, or at your leisure. Okay. So let's talk about some of the standard units that we're going to use for mechanics. And if you open up a physics textbook, you are going to find much longer lists. I'm really like you're going to find stuff on, you know, electrical resistance and ohms and current and all that stuff. You're going to find, you know, angstroms and all sorts of things. This is engineering, you know, a, a mechanics. So there's really only some basic uh, concepts that we need to employ uh, in here. So we do need to be able to express quantities in length and time. We need to look at mass, velocity, acceleration, and force. Uh, we don't really need to deal with anything else. Okay. So unless otherwise stated, just based on the nature of the problems that we're going to do in here, we'll typically express lengths in either meters or feet. We'll and we'll typically express time in I in seconds for, for both unit systems. So what that means is if I'm dealing with a velocity, it'll be in meters per second or feet per second. If I'm dealing with acceleration, it'll either deal, uh, it, bleh, it will either be in meters per second squared or it will be in feet per second squared. Okay, so those, are, those aren't um, unique units. Those are derived from uh, sort of our base units here. Now, mass and force, so let's talk about SI first. So we typically express mass in kilograms, uh, and then force will express in newtons, and newtons are defined as one kilogram per or multiplied by one meter per second squared plus. Um, now forces, so it's sort of backwards in U.S. units. So we have a standard unit that we use for forces in U.S. units. We call that the pound. Um, 
But for mass, we have a name for that. We call that the slug. And the slug is sort of the inverse of that. It's one pound divided by one feet per second squared. So um, it pretty, it's pretty much the same analogy, just in, in uh, SI units. We define the force based off the mass and acceleration. And in US units, it's just kind of the inverse of that. Um, as we get you know, geared into things, I think you're going to find this up. Uh, this isn't all that bad. OK. Um, you open up a textbook, you will find oodles and oodles of SI unit prefixes. And I'm sure there are textbooks that go well past this on either end of the scale. What I've done is highlight the ones that I think are the most important for us. So kilo and then centimillion and micro. I don't, I mean, I, I have been an engineer for a long time. And I'll, I'll be frank, I really don't think I've used any past these, really, you know, in, in common practice. So if you understand those, you're, you're good to go. And don't worry, we're going to have some examples of this here in a second. Okay, some additional notes on units. Um, so in USCS units, there are two very popular units worth noting. First is the inch. Um, so 12 inches is one foot. I think that's um, uh, pretty well known. The other unit, which you probably have not heard of, and this is widely used in civil engineering, is the kip. Okay, so a kip is just sort of a shorthand for a kilo pound. So one kip is a thousand pounds. If you're a civil engineer, you're going to be seeing kips for a long time. So it's something you might just want to start getting used to. Um, you'll see this in structural engineering and geotech, you know, you name it. Um, just because the, the reason that we tend to use kips uh, as opposed to pounds is because some of the forces that we deal with in civil engineering are just so large that it's just easier to, to deal with kips. I mean, it is not uncommon for example, in steel design, to design a column for 400, 500,000 pounds. So uh, instead of saying four or 500,000 pounds, I'll just say 400 kips or 500 kips. It's a little, little easier to, uh, uh, um, on the vernacular. Okay, so far so good? All right, so now we're going to get into some interactive stuff. We're going to do some examples. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to get out of the slideshow here for a second. I've got some other stuff I'm going to talk about here in a second, but I want to pull up our class notebook. Okay, so um, first off, again, so this is found within the OneNote, okay? So everybody can, um, can access this um, uh, uh, right now. If you were to open the OneNote on your tablet and whatnot, you would probably see this already here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go through some very basic unit conversions. And I want to make sure that everybody is familiar with this process. So if you understand what we do in this example, the homework should honestly be a, a cakewalk. Okay? And please do not hesitate as we go through this to, uh, uh, to ask questions to make sure that you're uh, understanding what's going on. Again, I want you to get your money's worth. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to um, convert these quantities. We've got 73 miles per hour. We're going to convert that to meters per second, and then we're going to convert 63.9 PSI to kilonewtons per meter squared. Now, the way that I do uh, example problems in here is we're going to go through the calculations in here, but I'm going to have you break out your Casio FX115 ES pluses or similar calculators. I'm going to have you do some of this with me, and you'll, you'll see how this works because I want you engaged, attentive here at 8 o'clock in the morning. Okay, so let's start off. Um, now, the, the general philosophy behind performing a unit conversion is to take your known quantity and multiply it by equivalent forms of the number one. Okay, what do I mean by that? If I take the number six and multiply it by one, what do I get? I get six, right? So I don't change the quantity. But in unit conversion land, the number one can take a very interesting form, okay? So, for example, one foot equals 12 inches. Does everybody agree with that? Does one foot equal 12 inches? So what is one foot divided by 12 inches? Right, right? Now, I'm not saying that the number one divided by 12 equals one. That's not true, right? But, the, but by incorporating units, the context is provided. One foot divided by 12 inches equals one. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these quantities and multiply them by successive forms of the number one to get from miles per hour 
to meters per second. That's what we're going to do. Now, what I've done is I've provided some unit conversions here to help guide us through the process, but we're going to um, we're going to uh, uh, probably need to rely on a few more. Okay, so let's deal with this first one. Okay, so this for, oh didn't mean to do that. Let's move this back up here. Let's do that. Okay, so let's start out. I'm going to start down here. So, man, this is not like the touch screen. I'm going to have to change the settings here on this computer. So, so let's do 73. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this a little differently. So I'm going to say miles, and I'm going to write this as hours. Okay, Because that's what miles per hour means. It means miles on the top, hours on the bottom. And what we're going to do is we're going to start multiplying this by successive unit conversions, okay? And the goal is to get this into an answer that is meters per second, okay? So let's start off, let's handle each unit one at a time, and let's see what we get. So let's start off with the miles. So I need to convert the miles into meters. Now, I didn't give you a unit conversion from miles to meters, I gave you a unit conversion from meters to feet. So maybe a natural question is, does anybody know how many feet are in a mile? You're on the right track. Say it again. 5,280. That's right. 5,280. So let's add that up here. Let's say that uh, one mile equals... 5,280 feet, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this quantity down here and I'm going to multiply it by a quantity. Now, do I do this? Hold on, let's see. Do I do this? Now, if I multiply it by this, would you agree that that blue fraction, that that is one? But that is the number one. But do I do it this way? You're shaking your head no. Why? Uh, you need to flip it because you'd be dividing the 73 by the 5280. Exactly. What I want is I have miles on the top. I want miles on the bottom. Because if I multiply those as fractions, I want the units to cancel, right? So I want miles on the bottom. So I did that wrong. Every now and then I'll do that just to make sure everybody's paying attention. One mile. Wait, oh, I did. I just now my coffee isn't kicking it. So that's correct, right? Because what will happen is from a unit's perspective, that and that are going to cancel, right? So if I were to just stop right here, if I just said, I'm done, I don't want to do the problem anymore, and I carried out these calculations, my final answer would be in feet per hour, right? Like, I, I would get an answer, but it wouldn't be in the unit system I want. I want meters per second, okay? So now, what do I do? So, somebody help me out. Exactly. I need to use that other unit conversion. And the feet needs to go on the bottom, right? So now what I'll do is I'll say one feet is 0 0.3048 meters. And now the feet and the feet cancel. So now I'm getting somewhere. Now I've got a situation where if I were to carry this out, I would get meters per hour. So I've at least got the meters part figured out, but I don't have the hours part figured out. So now let's deal with the hours, okay? Now this one's pretty easy, okay? What I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with the um, the hours to minutes, okay? Man, this touch screen's going to bother me. I'm going to have to turn that off. So we know that one hour equals how many minutes? 60 minutes. And we know that one minute 
is 60 seconds. So now if I look at my unit conversion, hours on the top, hours on the bottom, minutes on the top, minutes on the bottom, and if I look at what I'm left with, what are the units that I didn't cancel? I didn't cancel the meters. I didn't cancel the seconds. That's exactly what I wanted, right? So what am I going to get? So here's what I'm going to get. So I'm going to get an answer in meters per second, but what is that answer going to be? It's going to be 73 times 5280 times zero. Let me I can do better than that. Times 0 0.3048 divided by 60 times 60. I can do better than that. And the answer is going to be in meters per second. Does that make sense? Now, I ignored the ones. I mean, because I, I could throw the ones in, but I don't think there's any value there because it's just going to be the same number over and over again. So that's the answer. So what is that? Well, let's break out your Casio FX 115ES Plus or similar scientific calculator, and let's see what you get. Oh, yeah. I have my tablet set up to where the touch screen's deactivated, or this, the touch screen and the pen are deactivated, so they both turn on at the same time. I have to turn that off. 32.6. 32.6. All right, I have a second on that. Okay, I typically do that, is I will ask for a calculation and then a second. So, 32, goodness gracious. 32.6 meters per second, and that's it. So typically what I will do when I'm doing homework solutions or whatnot is I will circle it, and I will say something like ANS for answer, so, or indicated. So when we start, on, on a side note, whenever we start doing uh, scanned PDF submissions where we've got so many students in the class, whenever you have a final answer on the homework assignment, please try and make it very clear to those grading the assignments. So circle it, answer, make sure it's crystal clear. So, what do you think? It's not so bad, right? Any questions? Okay, so let's do this one. Let's do pound force per inches squared, commonly known as PSI, to kilonewtons per meter squared, okay? Now, I'm gonna cheat here a little bit. I'm gonna copy this paste this down here so that I just don't have to keep scrolling up. And it's 63.9. Well, I, I do that for a specific reason for this problem, and you'll see why here in a second. Okay, you'll, you'll understand why here in a second. Okay, so let's first off deal with the force first. So the same thing before, we'll deal with the force, and we'll see if we can get that into kilonewtons, because that's the goal is to get that into kilonewtons. So, so what we'll do is we'll say 4.44822 newtons is one, or sorry, I did that backwards. Maybe I need to drink my coffee. 4.44822 4, 4, is one pound force. Okay, so that will cancel that. Then what we need to do is we need to figure out a unit conversion that will get us from newtons on the bottom to kilonewtons on the top. And so how many newtons are in a kilonewton? A thousand, right? So I'll put one kilonewton and one thousand here. Boom. So that cancels. So far, so good. All right. Now we need to convert 
inches to meters. <clears throat> Let's start off with inches to feet. Okay? Let's start off with inches to feet. Inches squared. I, I'm getting to that. You're stealing my thunder. Ah, I'm just kidding. All right. So we know that. We know that. But as this gentleman said, there's inches squared. What that means is, is that if I were to just stop here, it wouldn't be enough. I would only have converted one of these inches. I need to convert both of them. So because there is an inches squared, what I have to do is I have to incorporate this twice. And that idea shouldn't be too far off the mark. I'm converting inches squared to feet squared. So we know that there's 12 inches in a foot, but how many square inches are in a square foot? Would it be 12 by 12. There'd be 144 little squares, right? So what's 12 times 12? It's 144. So the same thing's going to happen with meters, okay? I want to convert feet to meters. So I'm going to have one foot 0 0.3048 uh, uh, meters, but I have to do it twice, okay? So I need to... Move this over. And so now if we look at our cancellation, I have inches squared, but then I've got inches and inches. So that's how I'm able to cancel that. So inches squared, inches, inches. And then a foot and a foot, a foot and a foot. So what I'm left with, again, what did I not cancel? I didn't cancel kilonewtons. I didn't cancel meters. I didn't cancel meters. So I'm left with what I was interested in. And what I'm interested in is kilonewtons per meter squared. Okay. Uh, and in uh, stress land, that is referred to as a pas or pascal or a kilopascal. But I'm, I'm not getting too far into the weeds, uh, at least with this class. So that's going to be, it's going to be a big fraction. Let's see what the fraction is. So on top, it's going to be 63.9 times 4.44822 times 12 times 12 over... 1,000 times 0 0.3048 times 0 0.3048, or you can say that squared, however you want to write that. And that's going to be kilonewtons per meter squared. Yes, so like on homeworks, if we just like square the quantity, if we just have to do Oops, that. Yeah, that's fine. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I don't have, I'm not going to micromanage. That's completely fine. I just wanted you to see it here. So, so like, here's an example. Um, if uh, the, the point I want to make is that what if we had to convert cubic inches that you, instead of square inches? If it was cubic inches, you need to do it three times, right? And there are quantities in engineering that might be inches to the fourth, right? Um, we do have some moment of inertia computations where that's actually pretty common. So I just want you to know that if you have to do it two, three, two times or three times, I can do it. And it's one of the, uh, the downsides of exponents is that if you're going to hurry on an exam, it's easy to not see it. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I don't, go right ahead. As long as you are documenting your work and getting the right answer, I'm not going to micromanage in that regard. Believe me. Yes, sir. Say it. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. So the bound, I'm confused on the bound force. Um, so newtons are uh, kilograms, uh, meters per second. What's the pound force? The pound force is the standard unit of, of pound of force in U.S. units. So this is what I was talking about earlier where, see, this is what, that's a good question. This is what I was talking about earlier where in SI units, the way that we define force 
is based off of the base definition for mass and acceleration. Whereas in US units, the base unit is pounds, and then we define mass as the inverse. That, that's what I, yeah, that's what I was getting at earlier. That's a very good question, though. So sometimes what you'll see is, is pound sub F and pound sub M, too, to, to, to uh, define the difference. That's a very good point. What's important, this, this is what's important, is that um, I think what would, what would, you know, give, give me heartburn is if you were trying to convert pounds directly to kilograms, that would be the problem because those are two different concepts. Does that make sense? That, that, that's a really good question. Did I answer it? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Everybody else get that? And the, the reason why it gives me heartburn is it has it only works here. Yeah, exactly. That's 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 why most scientists don't want to do that. So. Everybody good? All right. So what do we get for this? Anybody have an answer for that? Say again. Four four zero point five seven. Do I have a second on that? All right. Um, did you include both the 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 twelve twelve and the zero point three zero four eight twice? Yeah, I got um, divided by a thousand times twelve. Times 12. Right. You might want to make sure that these are grouped too. So you're dividing oh, all of that. I was dividing by the um, meters. I'm multiplying by the meters. Yeah, that, that's okay. That stuff's happened. One one of the advice, a piece of advice that I always give whenever you're first starting to do this stuff, is do the calculation, then do it again. Just do it again. You should get the same answer because the formula didn't change. Um, but to go back to uh, a point I was making earlier, there is, a, again, there was a very specific reason that I wrote it this way. You are right. I normally would just write PSI as an engineer, but I wrote it as pound <laughs> force per inch squared because I wanted to visually demonstrate that this is square inches, you need to perform the conversion twice. Does that make sense? Any questions? This is this is good stuff. I mean, I want to make sure again that you're getting your money's worth. So far, so good. Oh, one more thing. Hold on. Again. Want to make sure that's clear. Okay. And again, um, I believe that's now synced. So if you check your, uh, if you have your laptop, pull up Teams, check out the course content folder on the uh, OneNote, and you should see all these calculations. So there's going to be some examples that we do later. Like when we get into 3D equilibrium, like they're not, they're not hard, but the problems are long, and there are a lot of calculations. So um, it, it'll be a very valuable resource, I promise. It'll pay dividends. Okay. So I've given you, uh, for your homework assignment, if you understand that, your homework assignment is going to be a brief. I've given you three unit conversions. Um, they have different levels of difficulty and whatnot, but they're set up as time quizzes. Um, so the idea is that you do the, uh, um, do the homework uh, or do the conversion, enter the value in, and, and Blackboard should grade itself whether or not it's right or wrong. And we're just going to do that for these. First couple of assignments in here. I have a couple other notes I want to mention here in a second. Um, one thing I do want to mention very briefly um, uh, is the concept of significant figures, okay? Because I'm sure that there's somebody in here that's like, he didn't mention that, or he hasn't talked about that. Um, so if you take a science course, you're going to find, um, a, a, you know, a lengthy discussion on expressing values in significant uh, digits. And while I think it is important to develop that discipline, I'm going to be honest with you, in most real-world engineering applications, um, you, you don't find that it ends up affecting your, your final design all that much. So I've always been actually kind of loose on uh, significant digits. If you as a student feel like more comfortable operating you know, your calculations in significant digits land, that's fine. More often than not, it really doesn't affect the final answer. As an example, so this homework assignment, I set up Blackboard to where it'll accept an answer, plus or minus a little bit of a range. And pretty much depending on however you do the calculation, if you perform the calculations correctly, Blackboard should, should recognize that you're getting uh, the right answer. 
So again, this quiz, you can do it multiple times and it'll take the highest grade. Okay, I'll get more into that uh, later. Okay. Okay, so um, the last thing that I want to talk about, and we're not going to finish this today. This is going to be a topic that we that bleeds into Friday. But I do want to talk about the idea of dimensional analysis. Um, I want to cover this because I think it's important. And you might have seen this in later courses or earlier courses, I should say. Um, but this is definitely going to be important in later courses. Um, you as an engineer are going to be using a great deal of formulas and equations to, to do your job. That's just how it works, okay? Um, and when you get out in the real world, there isn't going to be a Dr. Mike, per se, to grade your exam every time you're doing it. I mean, you're going to have supervision. You're going to have, uh, 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 you know, the, the process of independent review for your designs. But, but more often than not, you know, you're going to have, you're going to need to develop a certain degree of autonomy in performing your calculations. So one of the skills that you need to develop is sort of an internal means of checking whether or not what you're doing is correct. Okay, so one of the, those tools is being able to perform what's called a dimensional analysis. So here's what I mean by a dimensional analysis. Okay, so let's say we have a beam, a simply supported beam, and we put a load in the middle. That beam will deflect. Every, again, while we are dealing with rigid body uh, uh, assumptions in this course, nothing in this world is perfectly rigid. You put a load on something, it deforms. I don't care what it is. Um, we as engineers, and this is particularly a structural engineering concept, need to be able to compute the amount of that deflection. Because the idea is then we would size that beam to ensure that we didn't exceed tolerances, that we didn't exceed limits. Okay. Now, there is a very well-known formula for computing the, the deflection in the middle of that beam uh, under this load, and it is that formula right here, EL cubed over 48 EI. So what those terms represent is P is however much the applied load is. So let's just say that was in pounds. Um, e is what's called the elastic modulus. It's a material property that's unique to a given material. So steel has an elastic modulus, aluminum has an elastic modulus, brass, concrete, etc. Um, I is a section property called the moment of inertia. This is actually what the engineers would use to determine how big the beam needs to be. That's sort of our, uh, one of our design parameters. And L is the beam's length, okay? So this is where dimensional analysis would really come into play. If I was talking, let's, I mean, let's just live in the land of, of U.S. units for a second. So above us, there are floor beams that are supporting the load of the floor up here, right? There are floor beams supporting this load, okay? And these floor beams, okay, are, how, how long would you say they are? What, 30 feet, 40 feet? We're going to express those in feet, right? But hopefully the beam's not deflecting six or seven feet. Hopefully it's deflecting in a matter of inches, right? Make sense? So it would make sense that if I'm an engineer and I'm performing this calculation, I would want my answer to come out in inches, right? Well, in order to do that calculation properly, I need to insert a beam length that is also in inches. Because if I plug in into this formula with a beam length of 40 feet, the units are not going to work out. Here's what happens. See, if I plug in the, the beam length with uh, units of inches, okay, so what do I got? Pounds, pounds, uh, you know, force, forces in pounds, the length cubed, okay, the length cubed. So if I plug in a length of inches, inches cubed, Okay, what about E? E is an elastic modulus. What's the units for elastic modulus? PSI, so that's pounds per square inches. Okay, what about the moment of inertia? That's this new property here. I told you we might be dealing with inches to the fourth in engineering. Well, that's the section property of the section. It's in inches to the fourth. So let's carry this out. So if I have pounds and inches cubed on top, that's what I've got here. What about the bottom? Pounds per square inch times inches to the fourth, a couple of those are going to cancel, and I get pounds per inches squared. So the pounds cancel, and I get inches cubed over inches squared. I get inches. That's what I want, right? So what this dimensional analysis tells me, that in order for this to work and to get usable answers at the end, I need to plug in the beam length in inches. What if I plugged in the beam length in feet? It, it'd go haywire, right? You get feet cubed, and then you'd have to move backwards. Hey. Exactly, it would be a mess, right? It would be a mess. So 
There are two ways of handling that. One way of handling it is to convert your input units into inches. The other way is to develop conversion factors. And in structural analysis and later courses, we talk all about that. But what we're going to do on Friday is we're actually going to take a well-known expression in engineering. This is an energy expression from fluid mechanics. And we're going to determine whether or not that expression is dimensionally consistent. Okay, and if not, it tells you you either have a typo in your formula or there's something you need to fix. We'll deal with that on Friday. That's all I've got. I'm going to pull up the QR code so in case anybody missed it. With that, I'll see you on Friday.